Okay, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar. This is now our third webinar that we have hosted here at SUSE since the onset of this unprecedented crisis. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe. I hope everybody is taking advantage of some of this time with your family and keeping in touch with loved ones. And I hope that you're able to um, kind of keep focus on business at the same time, which I know is never easy. And that is what we're here to talk about today is business. And it's not easy to conduct business during these uncertain times. It's not easy to build your brand during these uncertain times. Um, there is a fine line constantly about wanting to, on one hand, continue to drive business as usual because companies need to make payroll. People don't want to lose jobs. But at the same time, not seeing seeming as insensitive and understanding that the end consumer on the other side of the phone or the other side of the screen is dealing with a whole host of issues. So what we tried to do today is is really try to decode this for everybody. We conducted research from our Suzy network of U.S. consumers to hear from them. What are they looking for right now from brands? What channels are they using and how should brands really look? over the next weeks and months, hopefully not too many months, speaking to them about their products and services in the way that's actually helpful to them. So uh, we're going to jump into it. Uh, at the end of this presentation, I am thrilled to have a close friend of mine and board member of Suzy, Gail Troberman, who is the chief marketing officer at iHeartMedia. Um, Gail is going to be talking a little bit about what she's seeing in the radio and audio world and podcasting and in terms of branding and celebrity marketing in general. So I'm um, super excited to have Gail join and hopefully this will be a format that we can really run with moving forward. So we're going to just get started and uh, jump right into it. Again, I'm Matt Britton and uh, CEO of Suzy and let's try to have some fun today and hopefully get our minds off the craziness that's going on outside all of our doors. So um, greetings from the Suzy team. Uh, the Suzy team has been working remotely now since March 13th. Um, it seems like we've been working remotely since 2013. I'm sure many of you guys feel the same way. Um, it's, it's just sort of surreal to wake up every day uh, and not go into an office and not see our close colleagues. Um, at Suzy, we have 75 employees with offices in New York City, um, which is obviously the epicenter of what's going on here in the United States, as well as in North Carolina and Birmingham. All of our offices are shut. We've been doing everything we can to stay close-knit as an organization. Um, it's it, it can be incredibly challenging at times to do so. I can't imagine what companies of five or 10,000 employees are doing to stay closely knit. Uh, we've been doing things like twice a week having all staff meetings, having departmental stand-ups every single day, having virtual office hours with the leaders of the company so our employees know that they can actually communicate with somebody, and things like virtual yoga and happy hours, a lot of things that many employees are catching on to now. I think just getting into the flow of things in business obviously was the hard thing, but now we're entering week three of this, and I think we are getting into a little bit of a flow at Suzy, and hopefully you guys are feeling the same way. So as mentioned earlier, we conducted a Suzy, uh, <laughs> we conducted a study on March 20th and 21st using Suzy's market research software. Um, we queried 939 U.S. consumers. Of course, the data in the study is weighted for U.S. census representation across age, gender, ethnicity, and re region. So you have a weighted sample size of consumers you can feel confident in knowing represents the United States population. Um, and we just put some kind of um, headlines of what happened over those two days. Things are changing so fast. We find that's often helpful just to give people a timestamp of what was happening when we conducted this study. And it's just so crazy because when we first did our um, initial webinar on March 6th, again, we were saying things like, this is going to be the summer of the American road trip. Uh, consumers will still seek adventures. They'll just move away from the coast. And now, you know, that seems kind of silly that we said that two weeks ago. So this is something that is changing so rapidly. It's such a dynamic situation. Um, and that's why we want to continue to provide value. Um, on this call are customers uh, of Suzy from all over the United States and all over the world, as well as really anybody from the media or any brand or agency that want to listen in. So this is not something that we're charging for. We want to try to add value uh, and just show everybody what we're seeing with the consumer as it changes so rapidly. So first and foremost, 58% of consumers are consuming more television and social media since the onset of the crisis. That should come to no surprise. People are home all day. Now all of a sudden they can watch CNN um, or another news channel in the middle of the day to learn about information. They're on social media much more because they're less in meetings with other people. Even when people are in Zooms, I wouldn't be surprised if they have another screen open and they're um, tweeting or talking to a friend over Messenger. So we have screens open at all times. That number's 
only going to go up. Um, our eyes are glued to screens. I had a conversation with my son the other day who's 12 years old saying, like, what would happen if this happened when there was no Internet? How would companies work? Um, during 9-11, when that went on, I often wonder what would have happened if there was internet access on the planes and how we would have heard the passengers who were going through that horrible experience, what they were seeing. So I think the fact that we are in an era where there's high proliferation, although not total proliferation, of high-speed uh, Wi-Fi within the home, it has made this slightly more palatable and definitely helped with work productivity and, and the ability to access entertainment for sure. So although consumers are certainly going to the television and the phone so much more to consume entertainment-based content, they still aren't necessarily trusting the media for the core information um, on COVID-19. And what's really interesting is that we have seen an increase in trust in the federal government since we first launched a study um, way back on March 6th. On March 6th only, 19% uh, of consumers actually said they trusted the US government um, for information on the COVID-19 crisis. And now that number's up to 53%. So that's obviously a startling change in a short period of time. A big reason why is on March 6th, if I recall, I think um, the president was saying that this was going to be a short-lived issue. I think we only had something like 20 people infected at that point, and he was predicting it would go away. So those who were concerned, obviously, that didn't believe in that theory, didn't trust. And now there's a little bit more of alignment, obviously not total alignment. This is not a political webcast, so we're not going to be going into that any further than that. Um, but it's interesting to know that the CDC and the World Health Organization are by far and away the most trusted sources uh, for information about this crisis. And anything that you would look at as more mainstream media, whether it be newspapers, which in, to me, that sticks out that newspapers outrank television and online and social media. People look at newspapers as a dying medium, but it seems to me that newspapers are not dying brands because consumers are still trusting them in a time of need um, as they're outpacing um, their counterparts in traditional media. When we talk to consumers about linear media, meaning not social media or not using uh, mobile apps, which have a two-way communication, but more one-way one media, you know, we asked them why they're accessing uh, linear media, and it really broke down the two different buckets. The first is information media. You know, they want to stay in the know of what's going on with this crisis and feel some semblance of control. For consumers that we spoke to, it came out loud and clear that the more information they had, then the more in control they felt of the situation. And when they were looking for information-based media, the first place they were turning to was Google. They were conducting Google searches um, in a variety of different search terms to really uncover what was going on, both on a local and national basis. They were also going into online newspapers. So we talk about whether it's the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal um, or New York Times or your local paper in your local market, they were going there for information. Broadcast television news came in third, and radio came in the fourth. So again, very interesting that newspapers are ranking so incredibly high here. And then the second bucket of media is a completely different mindset of the consumer, which we call entertainment media. And that's really built to help consumers escape the noise and really give them a retreat from the chaos that they're seeing in everyday life. And I personally have that light switch go off and on as well. There's some times when I want to just dig in and see what's going on. Um, and there's other times I just want to shut it off. And when I want to shut it off, that's where I'm going to my entertainment-based media. And it should go no surprise that things like streaming platforms really are the main way where consumers are going to Netflix or Hulu. Uh, broadcast TV is still up there. You know, we live in a country where if we live on the coast, we feel like everyone subscribes to Netflix. But in certain areas of America, that's, that's definitely a luxury. And um, they don't have access to streaming platforms. So broadcast TV and then radio and then podcasts in terms of entertainment media. Um, Gail will talk a little bit later about the audio medium in general. But obviously, when it comes to entertainment, um, audio is still incredibly important as we look at radio and podcast being the third and fourth most accessible um, and in-demand platforms for entertainment-based media. So when it comes for information-based media, we ask consumers, you know, what media sources do you trust most? And what we start to see come loud and clear is, again, Google was the place that consumers are going to when they want to find out information because they can kind of dictate the type of information they're getting, whether it's how many cases are in their local market, 
or what's the latest on vaccine and new treatment options, or even things like what, what's going on with the federal stimulus package and how it's going to help small businesses. But they're also going to Twitter. And Twitter is a social platform that we'll talk about a little bit later that has really jumped up during this crisis because of the real-time nature of Twitter. Um, I'm sure many of you on the phone know that both Facebook and Instagram don't, don't default to a chronological feed, meaning that the things that you see in the feed aren't necessarily the most recently post items. And when consumers are really in the know, they want to know what's going on at the moment, which is why they're really leaning into Twitter relative to other platforms. And then after that, obviously, you see a host or of who's who of uh, media networks that consumers are tuning into, mostly broadcast television networks, as well as um, you know your, your large-scale newspaper brands where they're getting their information media from. For entertainment media, you see a whole different cast of characters. Obviously, you see Netflix really at the top. Um, consumers are really um, you know, stream obsessed right now. There was a huge set of memes going out about um, the Tiger King, which was an, um, something that I really enjoyed. I believe it was on Netflix, maybe on Hulu, just kind of shows the parody in the streaming space. Um, but there are going to be hits that come out on these streaming platforms without a doubt um, as consumers really are just bored and kind of looking for things to do. So you see your Netflix, you see your Hulu, and you see Amazon. Um, Prime Video is really the three um, you know, reigning streaming platforms. And then you see gaming platforms like Xbox pop up there. Um, you see um, platforms like Spotify and iHeart that consumers are messaging. And then just like a long tail of cable networks, whether it be FX or AMC networks, um, that consumers are actually pointing to Freeform, Nickelodeon, et cetera. Um, TikTok um, has popped up many times in our research um, as a growing platform. It's something that I think continues to be overlooked uh, based upon its growing use and power amongst specifically the Gen Z, but now kind of edging to the millennial audience as well as in other trusted sources for media entertainment. So in terms of social media, and we talked about this during the last podcast, Twitter continues to see dramatic growth in usage. Um, over 47% of consumers say they're using Twitter more than a week ago. You see YouTube growing as consumers can really access any type of video there. And then you see TikTok, and I just want to make a note here. It doesn't mean more people are using TikTok than Instagram or Facebook. It just means the people that were using TikTok a week ago are using it 31% more. So you know, kids that are home and, and younger consumers, they love TikTok and, and the ones that are using it are using it more and more, uh, which is obviously really interesting to see. So again, Twitter is a place where brands really might want to think about. In fact, we promote it, this webinar over Twitter as a paid ad unit that performed incredibly well, better than any other social platform um, as a paid promoted tweet towards the right audience members. So we saw that loud and clear in our own marketing activities here at Suzy. So the other thing you really have to consider when it comes to consumers' media habits is that their lives have changed. You know, no more are consumers jumping on the subway or sitting in traffic um, when they're headed to work anymore. And because those daily media habits have changed, um, you know, platforms like podcasting are definitely being affected. Um, during the month of March, according to PodTrack, um, podcast listening has dropped 10%, um, while the entertainment or information-oriented podcasts have fared pretty well. Well, that number is really being dropped down by the true crime genre, which was an incredibly fast moving and fast growing genre in podcasting, which is actually down 30%. And I really think that has to do with the fact that if consumers are home, they're not on the go, they're not in the car, not in the subway. If they want to watch, watch true crime um, you know, content, they'll just watch it on TV versus having to listen to a podcast. Um, you know, right now, the commute for many people is just their stairwell. Right. So many people don't face too much traffic on their stairwell. But since they're at home, you know, they're shifting time that maybe they were um, using commuting in the past to doing things like gaming. So we're seeing a 75 percent increase in online gaming during peak hours. And that was actually, according to Verizon, um, according to a recent article in The Hollywood Reporter. So during peak hours, a 75 percent increase in gaming. I love playing Xbox myself. And um, what's amazing with a lot of these platforms is you really haven't seen any degradation in service really across the Internet. I mean, I don't know about you, but I keep waiting for the Internet to break and actually go down, which I don't even want to imagine what would happen if that happened for a couple hours um, here in the United States or anywhere around the world. But 
Um, there's a tremendous, obviously, pressure on servers right now around the world, but 75% increase in part and parcel with that is a massive increase in platforms like Twitch, um, which for those of you who don't know, um, is a property that's owned by Amazon that actually allows consumers to stream um, in real time their video games or watch other people play video games. And even here in 2020, heading into 2020, the notion of esports or watching other people play video games was somewhat of an oddity. So many people just didn't understand why would people want to sit around and watch others play video games. But now, without there being live sports, I got to tell you, watching video games is not so bad. Um, last night, we'll talk about the iHeart event last night that uh, um, was catched with his son. And it was like the closest thing to live sports I had actually seen in a couple of weeks. And I found myself fascinated with if his kids were going to catch the balls that Russell was throwing. So you know things are bad if you're actually sitting on the edge of the seat to see if an eight-year-old is going to catch a pass uh, by Russell Wilson. But that was kind of uh, where I was last night when I was watching TV. So consumers are obviously looking to make the most of their newfound downtime. And they're doing that through a variety of different ways. A lot of them just want to relax. You know, we live in a hectic world right now. And kind of the reprieve from the everyday grind, a lot of consumers has seen as sort of a, a welcome change amidst, obviously, a harrowing overall situation. Um, consumers want to read more, connect with loved ones. Things that actually popped out here are things like exercising and eating well. Consumers want to be healthy now. They do not want to be susceptible to disease. They want to be in control for preventative measures. And if exercising and eating well are the best ways that they can do it, well, then that's going to change their habits. And we saw that come out many times during our study, that consumers are incredibly interested in the fitness um, and healthy eating category and the active lifestyle category, whether it be buying bikes, or whether it be um, performing online fitness classes, or just eating organic whatever it may be, we're going to really see that continue to grow. And this can actually really change the fitness industry. Uh, it was already on its way to being changed before this with platforms like Peloton. And or I think we're going to continue to see that accelerate, as well as learning a new skill, personal development. So taking care of yourself, connecting with those that matter, um, you know, health and wellness, mental wellness, and learning new skills are things that consumers are looking to do. And then, you know, don't forget that many people who are stuck at home right now are families. And you have many two-income households uh, in the United States, and they are starving for things to do with their kids. Um, obviously, the easiest thing that many people um, are, are looking to do with their kids are, um, you know, watch movies. It's just the easiest thing that consumers can do. Um, and that's what many people are doing. Um, board games are another thing and, you know, just being able to sit down with your kids, but then you see things like cooking. Cooking is a, is a huge topic that many consumers are, are really leaning into right now. If you think about it before in a pre COVID world, and I guess that's going to be something you're going to be hearing a lot, the pre and post COVID world, right? Many people would order in or they'd go to restaurants or in two income households, maybe um, one of the parents would go out on a work dinner. But now everybody's home basically every night. And cooking has become a family ritual again, much like it was in the 50s and 60s. And I think that presents a massive opportunity for many categories. If you think about that time as a family, as a bonding time, um, and as a time to basically reflect as a family amongst everything that's going on right now. And that's something that popped up a lot um, in our research. So what are consumers seeking for at home? What are they looking to do more of? Um, what do they really kind of strive to do to kind of get their mind off things? And we really had five major um, kind of buckets pop up, pop up here. The first of which was digital experiences. And digital experiences could be defined a lot of different ways by a lot of different brands. But ultimately, it's replicating what an actual experience would be in the real world online um, and preferably with other people that craving for interaction came out so loud and strong in our research and 65% of consumers said they craved some sort of digital experience. We talked earlier about fitness and I was a little bit surprised that this number was so high, but 58% of consumers are seeking for online fitness classes. People wanna move, people wanna be active, people feel like they're stuck at home, especially in um, major um, cities where millennials have really gravitated towards, they don't have a backyard. Um, now the parks and beaches are becoming closed. They literally stuck in their apartment. Um, many consumers, millennial consumers have sacrificed um, you know, the space um, and the community of 
of, or rather the space and the um, privacy um, of the suburbs for the connectivity um, of being in major cities. But with that, you don't have a backyard and in an environment like this, that's why online fitness classes are in tremendous uh, demand. Skills-based classes, consumers wanna learn, kids wanna learn. Um, things like Coursera and Skillshare and LinkedIn Learning are in high demand right now as consumers have extra time all of a sudden, they think it's a great opportunity to learn new skills for personal development. Um, live streaming and performances, I'm a big fan of the artist Ben Folds. And the other night, I just saw a tweet from him that he was playing live in his living room for the piano for an hour and I turned it on and I streamed in via YouTube during dinner and I have to say, it was really nice. And it kind of got me away from things for just a small amount of time, just knowing that he was live and you saw all of his fans that were writing in the comments of what they wanted in the play. And now Ben Folds is doing that every week. I think every artist should be doing it, whether you're a garage band or you're Coldplay. There's really no reason why um, every artist shouldn't be out there trying to connect with their audience live, you know, audiences are in need of it right now. And it's fairly easy for artists who are no longer on tour, who are sitting home, who probably have the equipment to do it, um, to be able to execute on this. And lastly, uh, virtual parties. And I don't know how many of you on this phone have been invited to um, a virtual wedding um, or a virtual birthday party. Um, but there's so many of these going on right now, um, you know, as consumers are really looking for a way to connect as they're looking for ways um, for um, to connect better with hell, um, loved ones and close personal friends. So again, these are the big five that really popped up for us um, from consumers. So the big question, and really what I wanna spend the rest of our time before we speak to Gail, is where does my brand fit in, right? Where does your brand in these uncertain times fit in in terms of how to market to consumers. How much is too much? What is the right tone? You hear the word tone deaf over and over again. You don't wanna to appear tone deaf. And it is a balancing act. You do have numbers to make. You do have employees to pay. Um, some companies don't have that luxury. If you run a restaurant or, you, or you're working for an airline or a cruise ship, you don't have the luxury to do business right now, unfortunately. Um, but if you're lucky enough and fortunate enough to actually be able to conduct business, it is definitely a question that we found on the top of a lot of consumers' minds. Um, I posted this uh, post on LinkedIn last week and I had a ton of amazing feedback just talking about like before you judge that company for marketing its product, you no, know, they have a payroll to make, you know, before you judge that thought leader running a webinar, you no, know, their entire public speaking calendar is wiped out for the year. And I think the feedback I got on this post really nailed down the point that people are struggling with, you know, with the dichotomy of it all. And hopefully this webinar will help you guys figure out the right path forward. So what consumers are really looking for uh, for brands is brands that have some sense of humanity, that aren't just logos that are talking to consumers trying to sell them stuff, but brands that are informative and honest and, and clear. Um, content is more important than advertising. I would argue there's very little place for advertising right now. What's the difference between content and advertising? Well, advertising is, what is my brand's unique selling proposition? You know, 3% more absorbent, 350 horsepower, right? Those are uh, product attributes that then somehow get shoved down the consumer's throat during commercial messages. That's advertising. But content's a little bit different. Content starts with the consumer. What is my consumer? What do they care about every day? What are their unmet needs? And where's my brand fit in? And when you think about actually communicating right now, I would argue it was always that way in the social media era, but now more than ever, brands really need to stay content focused versus advertising focused. Flip the briefing from where does, where, how do I market my brand to what does my consumer actually care about? 67% um, of consumers reported that brands are more likely to buy when they feel that they actually care about the consumer and their actual situation. So there's certain sectors that really are um, ripe for messaging right now and others not so much. Um, consumers have said loud and clear they actually want to hear from food and beverage companies. Food is a big part of consumers' rituals right now. Again, especially because they're not eating out. They're doing less takeout. They're always cooking or cleaning and food and the next time that they're, they're eating as a family is always kind of top of mind. And that's why probably consumers want to hear from food and beverage companies. Entertainment right? They need an escape. And lastly, healthcare. And I think healthcare plays a role that right now, um, you know, the CDC and the World Health Organization are playing in terms of offering consumers trusted content. Consumers trust brands in many ways the same way or some ways more than they do 
institutions and the government. And I think there's a huge opportunity for brands specifically in the healthcare space to really be able to help consumers navigate this crisis uh, with the resources at their disposal. At the same time, consumers have told us that they want to hear less from luxury brands. They want to hear less from apparel brands. Um, any, any product that they look at is superfluous, um, less of what you need and more what you want. They just think it's less important right now. Now, I think brands like Louis Vuitton, O.A. Hennessy, who's transformed some of their factories into um, making much needed equipment for this crisis, you know, that's great that they're doing it. I would argue, though, that that's not advertising. When we ask consumers what great advertising is, a lot of consumers share to us how, you know, Dyson was making ventilators. And I think that's just Dyson trying to be a good corporate citizen, not necessarily, uh, you know, an outbound marketing activity. Um, and not every company has the ability to manufacture face masks or ventilators. Um, so I think that if you are a brand like this, I would definitely put your resources though, towards trying to give back versus marketing products to consumers that they don't really want right now, nor can they actually afford. Um, consumers are cutting back on travel, they're cutting back on uh, luxury goods, they're cutting back on gyms, giving other people gifts, things that everyone on um, this webinar would probably expect them cutting back on. Um, and they're cutting back because they're nervous. They're nervous about their ability to pay back their loans and to make their very basic financial obligations you know, there are so many people out there right now who don't have a job. Um, I just saw right before um, this webinar that Macy's is putting on furlough 130,000 employees. Um, in a normal week, there's about 300,000 people in the entire United States, um, maybe 500,000 people that are applying for unemployment. And here you have one company getting rid of 130,000 employees. Now, they're not laying them off. They are furloughing them. But it just kind of goes to show you the gravity of the situation. I was on another call this morning where there is a, a realtor who owned uh, commercial properties throughout New York City that is basically saying that 70% um, of their tenants are asking them to delay or cancel rent payment for the month of April. So it is really scary out there, as many of you guys know, and it's not the time to be marketing products that consumers really can't afford. And an interesting point that popped up during our last webinar is over 40% of consumers are feeling more concerned about the crisis on days that the stock market drops. They almost look at that as a barometer for the crisis. And the more it goes up, they have a feeling that maybe people know things that they don't and they can be less concerned. The more it goes down, they actually get more concerned about the crisis. So brands that are doing programmatic uh, real-time marketing, it's definitely something to keep in mind in terms of the stock market impact on consumer sentiment. So we identify three pillars of marketing that basically consumers have been asking for during the crisis. Uh, pillars that they find as effective at communicating them based upon their need states. And what I'm gonna do um, is I'm gonna go through these three very quickly. Um, talk about why these three pillars are important and what brands are doing a good job. And then we're gonna um, bring in Gail for a little bit more commentary. But the three of which are escape, community, and utility. So let's talk about escape first. Uh, consumers are constantly seeking ways right now to laugh, smile, or, or share, um, to escape the daily realities of what's going on. They really want to get out of the fishbowl of dread and get into somewhere where they can be in their own world, where they can feel creative or happy or feel connected with others. And to the extent that brands can help consumers create that escape, you're really winning and you're really offering consumers something tremendous right now. Um, especially given the fact that, you know, now's the time right now where March Madness would be going on and there'd be the NBA season would be heating up and the Major League Baseball season would be starting. Live sports is a huge thread in the culture of America. And right now, this country is devoid of live sports. And with that doesn't just come the inability for you to watch a game or the ability for you to actually attend an arena, it takes away your ability for many people to have that water cooler conversation, to talk about things that are actually happening live, to forge a sense of community. 47% um, of consumers are very much affected, uh, for example, by the cancellation of the NBA season. Um, you know, that's a big number, you know, that they are feeling impacted that they can't do something that was very much a part of their everyday ritual. On Sports Center, if you tune into ESPN, you know, it's a little bit depressing that they don't have any highlights to show anymore. A lot of people, um, that was kind of part of their ritual. So people are really craving, um, you know, an escape. Uh, I thought what iHeart did, and I'm not just saying this because uh, Gail's on the phone, 
But what iHeart did last night was tremendous for a lot of reasons. For those of you who don't know, um, they partnered with Fox and created the Living Room Concert for America um, to raise money for a variety of char charities helping people in need. Um, Elton John hosted it and people like Alicia Keys and Mariah Carey and, and Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day all performed. And the fact that it was put together, and I'm really eager to hear from Gail in terms of what went into that, but the fact that everything was happening not only so quickly, but it was happening live for everybody. Finally, I could go on Twitter and talk about things, you know, and I posted, you know, how did Lizzo get that Starbucks cup? And people are like, oh, yeah, how did they get that? And even that little conversation that connected people uh, was where the world had advanced to with social media, where you had these common points of passion and interests. Um, that no longer exists, those threads of affinities. And for iHeart to do that, I thought was tremendous. Um, Verizon is in the midst of a platform called Pay It Forward to help small businesses where they're doing live concerts. They had an a incredibly well-attended um, live concert with Dave Matthews uh, last week that, that performed incredibly well. And I think, again, any artist um, sh that can actually perform live, even if for 20 minutes, or just connect with your audience, I think it's a massive opportunity. It's also a massive opportunity for brands to be able to subsidize it um, um, and really um, help consumers get this experience. For brands that are looking to kind of create the notion of escape and don't really know how to do it right, I think it's always a great idea to talk to consumers. Our platform, Suzy, is essentially built to allow brands to talk to consumers instantly through an always-on software platform. Other companies like Jansport are building their own Gen Z think tank um, to help launch a TikTok campaign and they don't want to seem toned up, and they don't want to seem like that they're out of touch. So by getting influencers who have mastered the art of creating content on TikTok, they can be assured they're not going to. And I think it's a great way for brands that are venturing into trying to drive consumer escape to do so with confidence. The second of which is seeking community. Um, again, the, we're devoid of live events, and people are really craving these experiences that bring affinity groups together. Um, you know, I'm looking at over 500 people um, on this webinar right now. It feels good to me knowing that even though I'm staring into a computer screen in my basement, that there are 500 people on the other line right now listening to what I'm saying. Um, and you know, that's just a small piece of the community that I crave and probably everybody else really craves. So how can brands kind of deliver upon that? You know, there's things like BrewDog, which created an online bar experience. Um, you know, there's over 100 BrewDog bar, bars that are taking part of it to really let people have those virtual happy hours and things of that nature. Um, but I think the best way to kind of create community is around those passion points. You know, we talked earlier about live sports and music and things of that nature. I don't know how many of you guys saw this, but on Friday night I was on Instagram and um, a lot of my friends were talking about a DJ who I know um, named D nice, who was basically had created this thing called club quarantine where he went on Instagram live um, and was actually just spinning a, a DJ set, just like he would do at a nightclub in New York city or LA or Vegas on a Friday night. The only difference is that it wasn't at a club. He was doing it um, in his house. And there were over 100,000 people who took part, but not just everyday people, but people like Rihanna and Oprah and Drake and even Joe Biden um, logged in and you knew that they were taking part because they commented. And, you know, there's not many opportunities for most Americans to be able to be at the same party as Rihanna or Drake, right? But to know that they were listening to the same thing you were. And to know that you could talk to your friends about that Biggie song that DJ D Nice was playing gave them that sense of community. And I think this is an amazing opportunity. If I were a spirits brand or 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 you know brand that sold beer or an entertainment brand or um, you know a wireless service brand, I would be all over sponsoring something like this um, because you're really giving consumers something that they truly want. Last webinar we did um, last week, the beginning of last week, I talked about HQ Trivia. HQ Trivia was an app that really took off um, and then kind of went under, or supposedly it went under. And what really made HQ Trivia great, it was, it was an application where basically at the same time or twice a day, you could play in a live trivia game with your friends. And um, I was really happy to see this morning, the Wall Street Journal report, um, or le last night, that HQ Trivia is going to return, thanks to Anonymous Investor. Maybe somebody um, that was on our, my last webinar was one of those anonymous investors. I can tell you it was not me. Um, but basically, the fact that that's coming um, right now back in the fold, I think, is a great example of community. You know, everybody logging at the same time to participate in something that can, they can communicate with others around, I think, is a tremendous idea. And you know, this is this is something I talked about last time, and I'm going to be talking about it again and again because I think it's a massive opportunity. 
you know, we heard from consumers that they want to hear from food and bev companies. We heard from families that cooking is now a, a nightly ritual. We heard from consumers they crave community. If I were a food and beverage brand, I would create a live cooking show. And I would do it weekly. I would have ingredients that included ingredients that I sold. I would have a celebrity chef do it. And I would have America cook the same meal um, together um, and basically allow them to communicate over a digital platform together at the same time. I think that pulls together everything that consumers are looking for right now for family-based uh, community-oriented activity. And it's just another idea that I think is right for the taking uh, for the right brand to provide the entertainment value and really provide the community that they're looking for. And the last is utility. Utility is simply about trying to help consumers. It's really not about trying to sell them. So it's not about um, you know, giving a 50% off coupon with a minimum purchase of $300, right? It's really about saying, what do my consumers need? And how can I give them what they need without seeing too commercially minded? And um, I think, you know, one basic industry that could really own that is the healthcare brands because consumers need information. They need information about how to know if they're having the right symptoms or how to quarantine um, or what the right medications that they should be taking are on to boost their immunity. And I think the healthcare brands can really shift their strategy and some are already doing this to really, um, you know, play that helping role and utility-based role for consumers. Um, Peloton, just by them giving away a free 90-day subscription um, of its workout app, is helping people exercise, and we saw that many people want to do it. It's another great op, uh, example of a utility. Um, LinkedIn, you know, we see that consumers want online learning. They want personal development. So LinkedIn giving away free LinkedIn learning classes at home or uh, your favorite software company, Suzy, giving a webinar for everybody, that's helping consumers learn. That is an example of utility. Or a startup like Miro offering free large file transfers. Again, giving consumers really what they need, knowing that many consumers are working from home. And those are really the three pillars. And I know kind of the devil is in the details. Um, and one way that you could obviously always test things is, again, by talking to consumers, testing your ideas, making sure, um, letting consumers poke holes in your concepts before going to market because we are in uncharted waters and um, we are in a world where no one's been in before. So you want to test, test, test before you execute in this way, shape, and form. So that's what I have for you guys. And now um, I am going to open up a interview um, or discussion with my dear friend, Gail Troberman. Gail, can you hear me? I can. Hey, How's Gail. It going? So great to see you. Um, thanks so much for taking the time. I know you guys have so many great things going on. Um, Gail is the Chief Marketing Officer of iHeart. I've worked with Gail for nearly two decades, uh, going back to her days at Microsoft. Um, so it's kind of Crazy. surreal in this environment. So um, Gail, I'd love to kind of start off with having you maybe just talk about you know, the, the event that you guys threw last night on Fox and I guess what went into it, the, you know, the partnership and the execution and logistics that went into it and, and frankly how it all turned out. Yeah, it was, um, for those of you who saw, um, it was a pretty amazing event on uh, every level. Um, we, it was the Fox iHeart Living Room Concert for America. Uh, last night at nine was supposed to be the iHeart Radio Music Awards which we'd been planning for a year. Um, we had, you know, booked all the artists, created a beautiful, you know, scheduled live televised event with amazing performances and surprises and brand integrations. And all of that had to obviously be canceled because wow. no one can come together to have the iHeartRadio Music Awards. And it's probably not the best context to be celebrating people who've had great successful years in music. So uh, we talked with our friends at Fox quite a bit over the last week and um, decided, you know, should we do something? Should we do nothing? Which I think is the question most marketers are, are wrestling with in, in, uh, in Zoom chats around the nation sure. right now. And um, we talked a lot to the artist community and folks who were going to be part of the show originally and some other artists um, like Elton John who really wanted to do something that mattered in this moment. And what we came up with was, um, you know, I think a lot of the data, the Suzy data you just showed supports, um, people really are craving a couple of things. They're, they want to do something. I think we all want to contribute and try to help in this yeah. moment. 
um, particularly folks who are fortunate and um, are in a pretty good situation right now. So the artists were like, what can we do? Um, at Fox and iHeart, we certainly, we had the airtime already blocked. And so, you know, the next question became, uh, what do people want to hear and what matters? So we decided to make it a fundraiser. So um, a lot of brands like Procter & Gamble came on board, YouTube, uh, many, many others contributing to uh, Feed America and, um, and uh, some uh, supporting first responders families. And we raised a whole bunch of money. And then the next question became, so we've got a, you know, we've got brand empathy. We've got a good reason to do this. We're supporting the community. We've got an amazing number of talented artists who want to jump in and support. And then the third question is, what do you really want right now, uh, both on television or streaming? And, and you know, do you want to, what do you want to spend an hour of your life with your family watching? And uh, that came down to entertainment. And I think yeah. some of your data also showed, I think, you know, the news gets a little overwhelming. There's a lot of uh, a lot of harsh realities we're all dealing with right now, and people are looking for a little escapism, and yeah. so you know that's why we felt like um, an entertaining show, an uplifting show, um, with a little dose of you know the right messages. And there were some serious moments and some uh, shout outs to first responders and healthcare workers. We had a doctor actually performing phenomenal uh, songs. Um, and then we had some some real, you know, reality checks in there of, of what's going on in the world today and how how we all need to pay attention. But we had some great entertaining moments from, you know, Mariah Carey and Billie Eilish and Billy Joe Armstrong. And I mean, just phenomenal talent. But it's always challenging doing a live-ish show and doing it from people's living rooms uh, without their bands and the sound checks and all the uh, support that they're used to. Uh, huge congrats to every artist who, uh, who had the guts to go live and, and really just sing and, and play in their living rooms um, and be real and stripped down and authentic. And the um, response was phenomenal. I think yeah. we set a new uh, record for the time slot uh, from what I hear wow. um, on broadcast. <laughs> So I think That's we reached amazing. around 9 million people without the digital streaming. And anyone who missed it, uh, you can still catch the show uh, it's streaming for the next couple of days on YouTube as well. And right, um, we'll send out the link to everybody who's on the webinar. Um, so for brands that want to work with artists right now and entertainers to help give consumers that type of uh, escape, what should some of the things they should be thinking about are? Sure. Um, you know, I think, you know, you hit on a lot of them. Um, you know, what is appropriate for your brand to say right now? You know, I think, you know, uh, as a brand marketer by, by background, if you know your brand, you know your voice, you, you have a sense of where you should and shouldn't show up. Um, you know, the first thing, and we've been doing a lot of work with brands at iHeart is um, let's put a spotlight on anything you're doing that's good for consumers or communities. Uh, you know, if you're not charging late fees, like you said, if you're giving people extra extra storage or leniency, um, yep. your CVS and you're giving free delivery, um, you know, uh, any of those brands, T-Mobile, if you're giving people, uh, you know, extra data uh, without charges, um, whatever your brand's doing, um, it's, it's important and it's great. And, you know, we're encouraging people to let us tell the story for them. Uh, sometimes it's hard to pat yourself on the back and talk about great things you're doing. Um, if you come to us at iHeart, we can let our personalities go on air and, uh, you know, have the personalities and podcast hosts talk about great things that you're doing for you. So consumers will know about them and can take advantage of them, but you won't feel like you're out there shouting a little bit too loud or, like you said, being toned down. Yep, absolutely. Another thing we saw in our research was like audio and you know, the whole audio category, podcast, radio, et cetera, really kind of pop. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your take on, I guess, the role of that medium during these times? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting as a as a live local medium, uh, you know, in a in a normal week, we reach about 270 million, about nine out of 10 uh, consumers in America um, on broadcast radio. And as you said, um, we're all sort of seeing pattern shift. Um, we're seeing a lot of listeners um, who used to listen to us when they got in the car are now going to their smart speaker and saying, hey, Google, or hey, Alexa, play my favorite radio show. Um, so we're seeing a ton of growth, um, about 40, 50% lift in smart speakers and smart TV listening. Um, we're seeing huge lift, about 60% lift in web listening. So we're seeing the, the fact that we're live and we're local 
um, and we're human in the moment, I think is very important, both as a trusted resource for consumers and also as part of that conversation, that, that sort of escape from consumers. Yeah. Um, really, Absolutely. You know, I think people really rely on, on broadcast radio. And so they're finding it in new ways in the home, um, which is great. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we got some questions coming in from uh, the audience. So uh, one of which is, do we have information or what advice will we have for smaller companies, mid-sized, smaller companies that don't have the resources of a Verizon or a Procter & Gamble? What advice would you give to them? Sure. You know, I, you know, I think uh, a lot of the advice is the same. Um, you might use some different media um, and channels to get your message out. But whatever you can do to support your customers, um, whether it's leniency, it's tools, tips, advice, um, connecting them to resources that matter, you know, depending which category you're in, um, and then go out into, you know, some of the earned media too. If you're not ready to do a big paid media campaign, um, get out on your social sites and your earned channels and, and tell people what you're doing. Um, and lean into partners. You know, I always think as, as a small or medium sized business, um, a great way to go is to rely on partners and come together with some other folks, put your assets together. Um, and, you know, a lot of what we always say is, um, you know, start, start small, start in one market. Um, you know, I think right now I, I sit on all these panels, right? And Matt, you and I, like we, we all complain all year long about all the clutter in media and how hard it is to break through and get heard. And it's so expensive. I would tell you right now, you will probably never get more affordable media with higher consumer engagement Wow! because Consumers are paying attention. We're not as distracted and they're both seeking out more information and content and they're paying more attention. So yeah. every dollar you spend right now, I think has an exponential value compared to what it will be when everyone floods the market again. Yeah. So whatever media, whether it's local radio, whether it's digital and social, I would say go big right now if you have limited budgets because those dollars will pay off more than they will when all your competitors come back in and media Great rates point. go back yeah. up. We're seeing the same thing even in uh, B2B. I, it's funny, I got a question. Um, can you comment on B2B brands? And I'll just say, I mean, I do think a lot of the same advice exists. I mean, doing something like this, which is essentially just doing a webinar, offering value, helping people navigate this, is just a great way to add value. You know, businesses mm -hmm. have customers too. They just happen to be other people. And right now, it's kind of like it's, it's all merging together, right? Because we're all working at home. Um, I'm going upstairs and using Tide detergent, and then I'm going down <laughs> to my basement and taking a call. So that separation of work and your personal life really are being uh, melted together right now, for sure. Yeah, it's so true. You know, I mean, we, we've seen all these trends and, it, and it's interesting seeing them collide right now, right? We always, saw, we saw such growth in like live events and, um, you know, event attendance and ticket sales, both for sports and music and concerts. And now we're seeing, you know, like last night, just huge attention and that coming together in the home. So I do think work and life have always, they've been on a trajectory of blurring. Now it's, it's at a, uh, you know, almost uh, in undiscernible between where work and life uh, begin and end these days. And I, it'll be interesting to see if we come back to more boundaries or, or less as we come out of this. Absolutely. By the way, if you'd like to ask a question, if you just click on the Q&A link um, on Zoom, you could type in a question and we'll try to get to um, as many people as we can. And another question that came in is, what's the risk of quote unquote, we did this good thing brand message overload if all brands start talking about their philanthropic efforts? Yeah, you know, um, you know, I think it's it, particularly if there's something um, the consumer should know, um, you know, some value for the consumer that they can take advantage of. I, I think it's perfectly okay to let people know. I think it's like any campaign. Um, usually, you know, there, there's, you know, I think when you look at the data, um, the consumer tolerance, like you, you can go for a pretty high reach and frequency before you actually get people, you know, get backlash. I think as marketers, maybe we're, we're overly sensitive to that. I know in, um, at iHeart, we always look at the data about um, whether we should keep spinning a song. And usually just when you're going, oh my God, I don't, I can't hear that song again. Actually, most people in America are still discovering it. Yep. Um, so, you know, it, it does Great take point. a lot of reach and frequency to break through. Um, but again, I think, you know, the tone and, and wherever possible, if you can let someone else 
deliver the message instead of you shouting it, I think it'll be better received. And we're, we're seeing a ton of brands coming to us and saying, hey, can we get can we get your personalities to talk about some of the efforts and initiatives we're doing? And right. we even created a new uh, spotlight on businesses doing good where we're just running free airtime oh, for wow. brands that are doing great things in the community and, and consumers want to know. So we're, we're out there telling that story. That's great to know. Another question came in. Economists talk of the lipstick effect. Yet according to your survey, consumers want to hear less from luxury brands. So what I would say is I think how consumers act and their habits are different from what they want to hear on media and advertising. So mm -hmm. yes, we have seen research that some consumers um, do still want to get dressed up and put on makeup or, or look their best for Zoom. Um, but I think <laughs> traditionally beauty companies um, have really been more image-based advertisers um, and using models and it, it is about the image and they haven't necessarily gone too much in the utility um, or entertainment and the way that they've portrayed escape is more in the luxury variety, which I don't think is. So I think that if, if they're going to go to market, it's going to have to be slightly shift it from what's worked with them in the past. And again, I, so I think there's a difference between what consumers consume and what they actually want to hear from. So, um, yeah, we do a lot of work with, um, with, uh, our friends at, at L'Oreal. And, you know, I think, um, I think a lot of the beauty brands have been on a, a journey of really understanding L'Oreal is a great example of there's a brand that's about beauty, but also as a brand is very much grounded in this idea of worth and understanding a woman's worth. Yep. And so now would be a time to talk about that message and amplify that message. And so many of the good things they do to support women of worth and causes and charities. And they do, they have some phenomenal stories that probably a lot of consumers haven't heard. Now might be a terrific time to actually amplify some of those amazing stories that, that may not get noticed sometimes as much as the new product introductions and launches in a, in a more normal marketing moment. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, what do you think about offering coupons to consumers? So what uh, what about, yeah, like even talking about the luxury brand or any brand, I saw, a, I think it was Hyundai to advertise saying, if you were impacted by the crisis, you won't have to make any payments for X amount of months. Like auto copies are coming on really sure. strong with financial offers, but you know, what does that, how does that impact your brand long-term if you're discounting, you've never discounted before? How do you look at, at that? Yeah, you know, I think um, right now, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was looking at some podcast data this morning and um, our podcast listening at iHeart is up. I know you showed some stats from PodTrack that showed declines. Yep. Actually at um, iHeart, our podcast listening is up about 6%. And what was most interesting is we're, we're also seeing a slight dip in true crime. So I think people are, are looking uh, for a little less uh, negative, uh, scary news. We're getting yep. plenty of that. Um, <laughs> and people are looking for... Um, different types of podcast content. The, the number that kind of blew my mind to your question is um, the, the biggest category of podcast listening growth we've seen in the last week was business and, and finance or money podcasts. Those are up 78% wow. week over week. Well, that's right? utility, so right? I think, um, yeah. you know, I think right now you really can't underestimate the consumer need for all things, um, financial support, advice, and help. Um, the economy is going through a really challenging time. Uh, people are anxious about that. So um, I don't think this is a moment where you're going to see a lot of long-term negative impact from offering people discounts or reassurance or, um, you know, assistance and, and alleviating some of their pain. I think um, everyone would welcome that. And I think, I think right now you have to play the long game you know, as marketers, you know, we talk a lot about this usually, Matt, right? What are, what are the signals today? Which digital data, which stats, how do I follow them? How do I react in the moment? I think as a marketer right now, play the long game. Do the best thing you can for your consumers. Give them the best offers, the best incentives. Give them help and support um, in their communities. Do whatever you can to be useful and to be empathetic. And I think that brand equity that you can buy right now will last you for years to come. I think yep. people will really appreciate it. I agree. This is a time when I think the new set of brands are going to be built. 
uh, during this time if they can really focus on the consumer. Um, th this, I think, is super relevant to iHeart given, um, you know, its efficacy in the local marketing space and mm -hmm. uh, local advertising space. The question was, with the local automotive markets, where have um, where some are still allowed to be open and sell cars, what's the best way to get the message out? So you're a local car dealership. Um, you know, given the luxury pushback, given everything we talked about, you know, how can they get that message out in the way that really resonate with consumers? Sure. You know, I think we've seen in the, like you said, in the automotive space, um, I think we're seeing um, a lot of, you know, national brands at kind of the tier one level um, through to the dealers offering, you know, unprecedented incentives for consumers. And maybe, you know, today isn't the best day in New York to ever to leave your house at all. Never yeah. mind to uh, leave your house for a test drive. Um, but I think a lot of these programs that these uh, the automotive companies are launching now, I'm sure they'll sustain in market for, you know, some months to come. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity to, um, you know, really make, make your product accessible and affordable um, and be empathetic to consumers who uh, might need to make a purchase or might need to upgrade a vehicle to get to their jobs um, and maybe something that they couldn't have afforded just a month or two ago um, can now be accessible because you're being lenient on, on your fees. Um, so I, you know, I think it's a, at a local or a national level, I think, you know, making your product as available and accessible and affordable as possible to the consumer. Uh, that, like you said, those are the brands that are going to win long time, long term. Yeah, for sure. And then we're going to wrap it up. But I thought this was, um, you know, given that you're no stranger to working with ad agencies uh, throughout <laughs> your career, um, we, got, we have a bunch of agency people on the phone. And one question was, what ways can agencies help support our clients' brands best? We want to be good partners. How can we be there without looking opportunistic? So, you know, how, wh what would you be looking for from agencies right now? What does help look like? Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, right now, I think, you know, brands want to um, lean into their agencies for data, how are things changing? That's why I'm sure people are listening here today to get some some fresh, timely data from Ask Susie on where the consumer zeitgeist is in this moment. Um, I would say uh, lean into trusted media. I think right now where you show up and the credibility that that medium or that partner brings is going to be as important as what you say. Yeah. Um, at iHeart, you know, we really uh, we always score high on trust. Um, radio tends to be the most trusted medium in all the research that we've done. Um, and so look for trusted partners. Um, and I think speed and agility are going to matter now more than ever. We all talk about that. We all demand that of our agencies. Um, I think don't, as marketers, sometimes um, we're all guilty of overthink. And I think now is a moment to say, hey, we can do something more affordably and more efficiently than we ever could six months ago or we ever will be able to in six months. And I think the agencies that really win with their clients are the ones that aren't going to spend time uh, overthinking. They're going to encourage their clients and find ways to get in and act and have impact and learn um, and, and build some real long-term value now that, again, will, would probably cost you a lot more later. So, you know, I'd encourage the agencies to, uh, to be bold and take risks for their clients and encourage their clients to be bold and do the right thing. Yep. So to wrap it, Gail, I mean, what, so you had the successful event last night. What is, what's next for you as you work from the West Village, or I know you're working out of, uh, yes. what do you focus on next? What, we can, what can we expect to see from my heart in the weeks ahead? Sure. Uh, here in New York, uh, we're, uh, we're paying tribute every night on Z100. So uh, every night, uh, I believe at 8 p.m., you can tune in, uh, turn up your radio, uh, listen to uh, Alicia Keys, Empire State of Mind, and watch the Empire State Building synchronized real time as wow. a tribute to the healthcare workers so cool. uh, here in New York and around the nation. Um, a little fun moment. Um, and then, you know, we are, uh, we are, 100% open for business. We are broadcasting live on 850 plus radio stations. Uh, we can turn around audio advertising. We didn't talk about production and the challenge. Yeah. And if you, even if you have a new message, getting it out. Um, we are producing spots daily 
for all of our brands to make sure their messages are as relevant and timely as they need to be. So uh, if you have something to say, um, people are listening. They're listening on smart speakers. They're listening on laptops and phones. Um, and uh, we can get your message out at scale. Um, and we can tell your story for you, uh, hopefully in a trusted, credible, authentic way. So let's take some risks. Let's get out and have a voice. And uh, let's keep capitalism going. Yes. Well, Gail, thank you so much for doing this. I know you have a ton going on. Um, can't wait to be able to see you in person again, but for now, this will have to do. Uh, yes. But best of luck to you guys and wish the whole team at iHeart my best, and uh, we will be in touch real soon. Thank you so much. Um, for everyone else who is on the phone, I just want to thank you for joining. We will be doing um, a lot more webinars. We have created a hub um, at suzy.com slash COVID-19, which has real-time data and a consumer sentiment tracker that's being updated daily. You can also sign up for future webinars. We will be running at least one a week, um, maybe two. We're getting a lot of requests from inbound brands, so feel free to check in there. Um, if there's anything I can do for you personally, um, whether it be Suzy related or just you want to bounce ideas um, you can reach me via email or on Twitter um, at Maddie B um, Susie is a software company that allows companies to conduct on-demand instant market research from the consumers that matter so feel free to reach out to us if you're one of our clients thank you for continuing to support us for everyone out there I wish you nothing but health and happiness during these uncertain times hang in there we're gonna get through this together um, and until next time thanks so much for joining thanks everyone <laughs>